there having a sense that I had a vocation to be engaged in what some people have described as the culture wars, culture wars, what the Pope described in the Evangelium Vitae as the conflict between the gospel of life and the culture of death. And I had this general sense that would be my vocation. I decided in part to go to school in this place, this crazy place, San Francisco, which is sometimes known as Babylon by the Bay or uh, Sodom by the Sea. Um, <laughs> Uh, precisely because I not only wanted a good, strong liberal arts education, I also wanted to meet firsthand and on the front lines uh, this culture war and to understand uh, from whence it came, to understand the mode of force. I became president of the pro-life group in my uh, campus and uh, um, helped to lead a ultimately successful initiative petition which led to a ref referendum which overturned the first uh, gay uh, spousal law in North America, and which overturned the first gay spousal law in North America uh, in 1989 in San Francisco. So I, I fought a lot of battles there and in the process of those battles ended up uh, coming closer to the heart of the church in a spiritual sense as well. I was working as a registered nurse when the epidemic hit, before we even knew what it was. I was hanging blood in the hospital and the infectious disease doctor um, said to me, Eileen, put gloves on, we don't know what this is. We had just never encountered um, so many, particularly young men, coming in who uh, very quickly went downhill completely. Uh, most of them ended up being intubated, tubed, and they were fully conscious and they couldn't communicate. It was clear that it was all gay people. So there was all this discrimination that was happening. Uh, seeing patients in rooms uh, that weren't cleaned, food outside the door, people not allowed to go in. No one was touching or communicating directly, or very few people. And the patients just really felt all alone and, and were terrified. I found all of that just very disturbing, and luckily a number of people around me did as well. There would be a group of us that would feel comfortable um, going into the rooms, and you know, it wasn't that I didn't have my own fear, but it was people my age, it was my co-workers, it was my cousin, it was my friend from high school. Particularly most gay men who wound up in San Francisco and were here at that particular period in time um, were somewhat distanced from their families. They had just broken off all ties. Um, but as people were getting sicker and people were dying, um, you know, they were letting their families know or they were asking their families to come see them. And so families started appearing. Some families would appear and immediately, you know, exert their, quote, legal right uh, to make decisions uh, for patients. So there were times that people's lovers or best friend who was there with them were not told what was going on. A person like me found myself uh, really unable to handle that and I would find myself talking to the friend or the lover, the partner of the person. James, Edward Ross and I were together for about 12 and a half years. When we met, I loved his, uh, you know, his balance. He had just this wonderful, uh, you know, enthusiasm and energy that was always good to be around. You know, he kind of, he kind of recognized that, that the end was coming. Um, so he was in the hospital bed more. He had made a point of having flowers there like all of the time so he said we're gonna have this little shrine he said I understand that when you go you know like you want to this is the last thing you see on your way out so I had this photo collage of our life together it was clear that at that point he had shifted and you know he was gonna be dying You know, there are a number of things that I had a, you know, I had a, uh, a 
emotional connection to, you know, but, you know, uh, you know, the piano that we played together, it been nice. Uh, the bed, photos, uh, notes. It really came to force when, because of the AIDS epidemic. And it was obvious the discrimination was taking on horrible stories of people being torn apart because they couldn't visit in the hospital or a partner dying and someone else would come out and take over. We felt very strongly that this was an individual rights issue. It was an issue of people who are coming together, living together, supporting one another, and have a close relationship, those relationships should be encouraged. And if one of them is hospitalized, it is a social tragedy that they're separated, that one can't visit the other. This made no sense at all. And the Republican Party Central Committee in San Francisco endorsed that proposition, as well as the Democrats did. I decided in part to go to school in this crazy place, San Francisco, which is sometimes known as Babylon by the Bay or uh, Sodom by the Sea. Um, uh, I became president of the pro-life group in my uh, campus and uh, um, helped to lead a, 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 a ultimately successful initiative petition, which led to a ref referendum which overturned the first uh, gay spousal law in North America. I saw that kind of arrogant smile when he talked about his involvement in the initiative campaign and overturning it. He identifies apparently as Catholic, uh, so so am I, and so and in that Catholic context, you know, I you know I want to say again, sort of Jimmy's last night, uh, you know, last night here, he got up during the day and he said the word for the day is enthusiasm, and he said, but you also have to be gentle, and we put those words over his bed, and and that was his spirit, and he talked about. You know, I think gentle enthusiasm or returning, uh, you know, to you know, home. Um, and then he said he wanted to go to church. And I said, well, I don't think you can go to church, but there's no reason why a church can't come to you. So we had mass at the bedside the night before he died. I mean, all of the friends, uh, closest people. Uh, excuse me. Repentance is a good thing. But on the path to repentance, you must admit that you did wrong, confess that you did wrong, and then atone. So I would look forward to the day that he understands the damage that he did and atones for it. It's not a simple apology that, oh, I was early in my educational time and I've changed my attitude a little bit. Sorry, that doesn't do it. That doesn't help the, the person under that tombstone over there and the lover over here who was separated from him. It doesn't help this family over here that was split apart when the lover's family took the body out of the hospital and wouldn't let the partner even go to a funeral. Sorry, it takes more than that. It would be sad if there were enough people to vote for him. That's how, it would make me sad and uh, and talk about hope, it, it, would, uh, it would take away my hope for the future. We all see the same problems. Conservative and liberals see the same problem. It's just the solution may be different. So as you march toward the ballot box, stop thinking of us versus them and think about what are your core values in this world? What is important to you? Is it important that we treat people fairly? That we treat people equally? Is it fair that we allow them their own journey towards wherever they're going, as long as they're contributing to the common good, as long as they're supporting one another? They're not hurting anyone. They're living the kind of life that you wish everybody would live, supporting one another, loving one another. Think about that and don't allow yourself to be swayed by other people who have another agenda. And their agenda is, let's make it us versus them. There isn't any us versus them. We are all together. We are all struggling.
to make things better. We are all struggling to make sure that our neighbors are sane. We're all struggling to make sure that we're all safe, that we all get educated, because our society will grow, will, will flourish.